Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It's been a while. Uh, it's your boy, John of the Macri, with you for another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast. Uh, I hope I remember how to do this. It's, I thought about this about half an hour ago. It's been, uh, I believe, nine days since I've been in front of a microphone. I forget if the last thing I recorded was on f- the Friday or the Thursday uh, before the break. Um, in any case, uh, I'm joined today not by Jeremy Cohen. Jeremy um, had uh, some come up that I'll, I'll let him talk about next time he's on. Um, but stepping in to his uh, his cavernous shoes, I mean, truly, uh, th- the only man who could who could possibly fill that void, and that is Benji Ritholtz. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm good, man. Um, yeah, cavernous shoes is right. He may be short, but he's not short on knowledge. We're off to a running start. Uh, no, he's not. No, he has lots of. It's a, he's long on knowledge, actually, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> it's been has it been a long like day for you, a long weekend? It's been a, it's been. Uh, I've traveled today, so I'm a bit loopy, and, and as you know, I'm sure you've traveled with kids. Uh, oh tra- boy, I, we we could do a whole podcast on that, which I'm sure people would love. To listen to me complain about traveling with kids. That's exactly why people tune in today, right? I've traveled with kids and had nightmares and woken up in a cold sweat thinking about traveling with kids. It is not something that anyone should ever do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, but we're not going to talk about that right now. Um, how you doing, man? Seriously, I, I, I feel like uh, when is the last? I mean, we we te- we didn't text for about a week when I when I texted you guys. Right before it was a, it was like late Friday afternoon. It was before sundown because you responded. Uh, and I'm talking about a, like a week, a, more than a week mm-hmm. ago. I was like, all right, guys, I'm out. I'll see. You. I'm going <laughs> to unplug for a bit. I'll see. You. I meant it because I, I wasn't really chiming in all that much for a while until this, until like the last several days. So, how, how have you been? I'm good. Yeah. I, you know, it was uh, everyone needed the break and it, and it coincided with, with like the Knicks needing a break. And I think anyone who covers the Knicks needed a break from the Knicks who needed a break. Like it all came together there where everyone was just exhausted collectively in this uh, organization's orbit. So (laughs) it was very nice to have a week to relax for a bit, recharge, re-energize, and we're back and we're still very shorthanded and still exhausted, but we're trying our best. Yeah, it's funny. Like it, it, I... I don't tend to zoom in on, and we'll do the weekend review in a second, but like, I don't don't tend to zoom in on the upcoming schedule, like the, the, the nuances of like the upcoming schedule. I I remember not not to use my hands because it gives the thumbs up there Uh, until like we're actually like in in, uh, at the week where the the games are going to take place. So like it didn't hit me until like probably yesterday that they were going to play back to back this week with Detroit on Monday and then the Pelicans um, on Tuesday. And so I'm like, Oh Jesus Christ, it's going to be, we're going to be four games after the break and we're going to be right back to where it's like, Oh my God, these guys are going to need a wheelchair to, to get off the court. Um, you know, Josh Hart, what did he play? 44 minutes last 42, 40, some 40, 40 something. It was a start with four against Boston, which are like taxing minutes. So yeah, man, they needed a break and it feels like they're going to need another break. And let me just start like kind of big picture. What's your what's your mindset right now with this team? What do you care about? What do you what are you worried about? What are you curious about? Like where where is your thought process? When you think of the Knicks right now with 25 games to go, where does your head go to automatically? It, it's not a difficult answer. It's just like how healthy can we get in 25 games? And then the secondary question is how good can we be and how many wins can we bank without full health? And that leads me into the question of like the trade and what that means and how those guys have looked and what they can contribute, what they can't contribute and trying to somehow keep Brunson like relatively fresh (laughs) going into the playoffs. And uh, it's, it's definitely a concerning situation. They've lost a lot of games all of a sudden. Like we're now what, four out of five, I think. Uh, um, well, no, uh, 
because they lost. So let actually, you know what? Good t- good time to take a step back. Um, yeah. We'll do the quick quick week and review. So let's do that. We went into the break. Uh, this is why they pay me the big big bucks, Benji. Um, we went into the break um, with, or since the last time me and Jeremy recorded, at least we went into the break with two more straight losses. So four straight overall heading into the break because they drop games. Um, hold on, I'm just looking at the schedule here. They dropped games against Dallas and Indiana. The Dallas one was the one you could kind of really understand because they didn't have anybody. It was the the night of the trade. They were playing. Uh, Brunson was not in that game. So lost that game. Great effort. Fine. Nobody's really worried. Followed by the Indiana game, which is when they had the new guys, but they were just run out of the gym by that Pacer team. Okay, two in a row, which led to the last two before the break, which again, we haven't discussed on this on this podcast yet. Mm -hmm. The Houston game and the Orlando game. Um, I don't know if we need to. I haven't uh, other than the post game. I haven't talked about the Houston game. I really want to talk about the Houston game. I, I the one thing I will say about it is as like it's so funny how one result can often change how you feel about how things are going because if you just flip that one game, right? Which again, we don't need to discuss what happened, everybody knows what happened. If you just flip that one result, then all of a sudden it's not four straight losses heading into the break. It's three out of four. And now if you and in the Philadelphia win and the Boston loss, it's two and four over the last six as opposed to one and five. Now, that may not be a big difference to a lot of people. To me, it's like, it, it, and also if we go even further back, it's six and five in the 11 games since OG and Randall went out instead of five and six. So it's like you're still above 500. So it's like all these little things kind of flip. And then obviously the last two games, um, they beat the Sixers in what was an interesting game. You spoke about that extensively because you did the post game, and then um, the Celtics game um, on Saturday, which I'm I'm curious to dig into. So that yeah, so long winded way of saying five out of six losses. That's where we're at. It's five out of six. Yeah, uh, yeah, and it's like concerning because it's only concerning to the extent that we thought there might have been some hope to avoid a second round matchup with these Boston Celtics. Are you out like, on that? Not out. But I, look, I, 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 Cleveland keeps winning. They were, they were down to Washington tonight and they, they came back and won, which they seem to do a lot. Um, and Milwaukee has, has come out of the break on fire. So like, and I, I, I know we've sort of disagreed on this in the past. Like I, I still am very fearful of Milwaukee and I think they're going to go on a run here. So we've disagreed on that. I think you said, I think you, you've been more concerned about them than I, maybe I'm wrong. I've, Maybe I'm confusing you for somebody I know, else. I, I have a lot of respect for Milwaukee. I I think the matchup is interesting. It's an interesting matchup, I think, for both. We don't need to get to get sidetracked on this, but no, I yeah. I have a lot of respect for. Okay, for so you're with me. Yeah, like so. Yeah. So I think those two teams are going to continue to win a lot of games, and the Knicks are not going to be healthy for at least another few. So we're running out of games to catch those teams, and yeah, and look, you have Indiana now breathing down your neck, and they keep. They're impressive. They're just impressive. I know. I know. We don't Knicks fans. The last thing they want to do is admit that they're impressive, and they're a tough matchup for anyone. Benji, I did a I did a mailbag before the break, and somebody asked me, "Who do you fear the most in the East, other than Boston?" And I'm like, "Man, Bucks are going to put it together. I have no doubt they're going to put it together. Like they're they're scary. Like if Embiid comes back for the Sixers, like that should speak for itself. Um, Miami looms. Like they're they're." They are the zombie. They you, like you kill them and they get up again, and then you kill them and they get up again. And you know what my answer was? It was Indiana because I have zero fucking desire to get into a, a seven game series with that team running up and down and up and down the court. Like that's just I don't think anybody wants to do that. I, mean, I really don't think the Knicks want to do that. But again, I'm I'm so getting like, this yeah. Story. That's the point though. So like in the current state that they're in, it's like what really? And again, you're, you're it's not half a season you have left. You have 25 games left. Like what are the chances? That they can outpace those teams. I'm not hopeful. I'm not. I'm not ruling it out, but I'm not hopeful. But like at the same, okay. So even if that doesn't happen, if we can get healthy, I'm excited to see it. I'm really excited to see this Knicks team, a healthy Knicks team in the playoffs. I don't care who they're playing. I am really excited to see what it looks like. Um, so at the end of the day, the priority one is health. Like, what, can we start filtering guys back into this lineup? Um, I'm really confident about OG coming back. 
the Randall reporting is confusing, confounding. I, I, I've always kind of said like shoulders are extremely tricky. And like, even if he does come back, the way that guy plays with a separated shoulder concerns me. Um, Mitch, like who knows? I think that's totally up in the air. And then Hartenstein, like, I don't know what's really going on. Like that's been interesting coming out of the break and seeing him play as little as he did in game one, played more yesterday. Um, and looked better, but I don't think quite looked like like a January Isaiah Hartenstein. So all that's concerning. Uh, I don't know. I, that's not not a particularly positive outlook, but that's kind of where I am. Where are you? No, it, it's like um, I feel like you. I mean, you articulated it great. I feel like the rest of the season is where the cons- the, the the areas of concern for the rest of the season are are in two sliding scales that are very much interconnected which is which is to say like 10 games from now we could be sitting here and being like well it was the 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 notion of getting a top three seed was fun while it lasted um but that ship has sailed because we've gone you know i don't four and six in the in the in the last 10 games and Cleveland and Milwaukee are you know they went eight and two or seven three whatever it is like there is a world where with with you know three or four weeks left in the season you know four weeks there's certainly three weeks left in the season there's a world where the Knicks are like okay you know I, I can't believe I'm saying this out loud but like we got to make sure that we stay out of the plan like that is not Insane. And if you listen, anybody who listens to me I think that's insane go look at the standings I'm looking at them right now Knicks are a game in front of Philly they're a game and a half in front of Indiana, who has won three in a row. Um, they are uh, at the. This will change because our, we're as we're recording this, Orlando is about to lose to Atlanta, so they're going to be two and a half games up on both Orlando and Miami. Miami has won three in a row. Orlando had won three in a row. Like all these teams are winning. Eight, Orlando was eight and two in its last ten games. Miami seven and three in their last ten games. Like all of these teams are doing well. I have no reason to believe any of these teams are going to stop doing well with the exception of Philly. Now that gets really interesting. Like does Philly continue to slide down. Um, so like, or, or there is a world where like the Cavs and bucks are just like, okay, over their next 10 to 15 games and the Knicks, you know, surprise us again. So I don't really know. Like it's, it, I, I don't really know which is like more concerning. Ultimately. Yes. They need to get to the playoffs healthy and like at the end of the day if they are healthy and they are out of the play-in and they're they're somewhere six or higher does it matter like that much what the C I mean it, I guess you could argue like yeah certain teams you might want to avoid but I, I don't even know like who are we like absolutely like we can't play this team as opposed to this other team in the first round I don't even know what the answer to that question is no, because you're not right. In the first round, I don't think there's really an answer. I'd, I'd want to avoid Milwaukee personally. Um, sure, that's fair. That's fair. And they're, you know, I, I don't. I guess it's theoretically possible they match up with Boston in the first round. I don't see that necessarily happening. I would want to avoid those two. The rest of them are all, I think, acceptable matchups and pretty. I mean, you just listed the standings. It's an even. It's pretty even. <laughs> I mean, the records are even. I think the quality of teams are pretty even. And by the way, I don't think any of these teams want to play a healthy Knicks team either. Um, so Including it's, Milwaukee, I would think. I would guess. I, I would, don't know. I would, yeah, I would think. I mean, it's... The East is interesting. It's an interesting... Um, it's not like the West where you have like 10 teams that are kind of scary. <laughs> but you do have eight that are that are kind of scary. I, I wouldn't think... I, would, I don't think Orlando's that scary in a playoff series. But, I, you know, Indiana certainly has its challenges. Um, if, if Philly gets healthy. If Philly doesn't get healthy, I'm not scared of them. But if they're healthy, I'm scared of them um you know it's it's a tough it's a tough conference and a lot of good teams and look this is what tibbs does though man like and this is why (laughs) who said it in the um what's his name the former gm of bob myers was was on the uh halftime show on espn last night and his quote was tom thibodeau is the best regular season preparer in the nba well you said which i thought was was an interesting sort of backhanded compliment, but you know what? <laughs> you know what's really valuable for the next 25 games is having the best regular season preparer in the NBA. So this is what he does. So hopefully we carve out enough wins here to stay in pretty good shape. Didn't I mean, didn't we kind of see that in 
the two first halves coming out of the break. I mean, they were up by 26 points against Philly. Absolutely blew the doors off of the Sixers uh, over, you know, the first 21, 22 minutes of that game. And then, and we were texted about it last night. I, I, I texted you and, and Fred and Andrew at halftime of the Boston game. I said, I don't think I've been more impressed by a Nick half first half performance all season than I was because that Boston team, I, I wrote, um, I wrote for Monday's newsletter. I'm like, they are, they're like Tiger Woods in like 2000, 2001 around that era where he went with, you know, he's like the, the, the famous quote, like I didn't have my A game today and he would still walk away with the fucking trophy. The Celtics don't need to have their A game or their A minus game or their B plus game. And they could still like embarrass you. They had their A plus game and the Knicks were tied. Uh, with they hung, they hung in until they didn't, but they hung it's, in. Yeah. It's yeah. they didn't. Right. And then I think it kind of became a little bit of a talent thing and, and a little bit of a, well, we who, who look at our horses now and the horses that were supposed to help. And let's so let's get into this. So we've had our we've had a disagreement of sorts since the trade, not the OG trade, the, the, the second trade, the Grimes trade. What should we call it? Should we call it the Grimes trade? Should we call it the Detroit trade? The bo- the 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 B and B trade? Bogey and trades? Trades? What? The Fournier trade? The, f- <laughs> the Malachi trade. <laughs> Here and after the Fournier trade. Yeah. The 48 trade. Let's call it the 48 trade. So this it's the 48 trade. Um has he got any game yet for the post? That's okay, we're not Yeah, yeah, it. he got shoved. He got shoved oh, by Oh, uh, he was involved with all that nonsense? No, no, who was it? It was a former Nick also who shoved him. Oh, I don't even know. Or this he shoved um, Obi? I think it was Obi. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. I hope I'm not misrepresenting that, but I, I'm pretty sure that's who it was. Listen, I didn't even know he was involved. I know of the fracas of what you were talking about, but I do not yeah, I, yeah. I don't know uh who else was involved in any case um i was very high on the trade and i remain very high <laughs> on the trade Mont- we have to talk about the pistons monty williams is playing everyone he plays like 13 guys a night which is driving pistons fans totally insane sorry that was my pistons tangent go ahead you know what would be really funny and i i had this legit thought over the weekend if like monty williams made a trading places style bet with like an executive in the league <laughs> Where he's like, I bet you I could get these motherfuckers to sign me for the richest contract in coaching history and then get them to fire me after one season and pay me all that money. And like double his, like someone was like, I'll double your money if you could pull it off. Yeah, like I'll hire you to a bigger contract yeah. if you could get fired after one year. Is it, it that? Does, that's, is that it seems that's like it? that. It seems like that. It's crazy. It's, it's like insane. there's some malpractice going on. Yeah. Well, now watch me lose to them uh, on Monday night. Uh, <laughs> oh God! Not even putting that out into the ether. Uh, so, I, I'm I'm still high on the trade on the on the Fournier trade um, for a few reasons that I, I think I've articulated. But like, I I think if I could boil it down to two points, it's and I and again, you know this, but for any for everybody listening at this point, for me. And I don't, and the reason why I don't think the Boston game is a good example is like Boston is one of, I was about to say one of how many teams, they might be the only team in the league where if there is any weak spot on the floor, if it is a weak spot on offense or if it is a weak spot on defense, they will find a way to exploit it if they are fully healthy and if they are firing on all cylinders, which they were. You cannot have a weak spot on either end of the court. Um, And that includes like a version of Boyan McDonovich, who is not so spry on defense, and a version of Alec Burks, who is Alec Burks, and uh, does kooky things sometimes. <laughs> I, and nobody loves Alec Burks more than you, but like Alec Burks is is who he is. Like these these guys are who they are, and there is a reason why they you know, they they did not. As, and Jeremy has said this. There's a reason these guys didn't fetch a bigger return. Like they are, they are good for what they are. They are good for, and I think what they are good for is against like 90 plus percent of the teams in the league. You can put them out there for 20 to 25 minutes a game, each of them respectively, maybe more if if one of them really has it going, and not feel like you're losing too too much. 
And the fact that both of them offer a decent amount of positional versatility, again, with the caveat. And, and again, you you justifiably made fun of me when I came on this podcast a few weeks ago and talked about a switch everything defense featuring bogey, bogey. And you texted me you're like, what? Because like, <laughs> yeah. Well, did, you, did you see him switch on to Al Horford last yeah, night? Because that didn't look too switchable. No, it didn't look too switchable. But like switchable to or, or sorry versatile to an extent like if you need to play bogey at the four you can play him at the four if you need to play him at the three again against a lot of teams not every mm-hmm. team mm-hmm. but against a lot of teams so in the spirit of what you were just saying a few minutes ago we just we got to get to the finish line in one piece and not overextend these guys if we look at the landscape of the league and you're like okay if that was the goal if the goal was to get to the finish line in one piece without guys dragging their their lifeless corpse across you know the, that finish line in, in mid-april um was there really going to be a better deal out there and you had to give up grimes and that's i think the other part of it where we kind of disagree because i i think i had kind not t- that i'd soured on grimes but in terms of grimes's role on this team at this point we could we'll probably get into like why he had gotten to the place that he got into here um i was less I was less concerned about giving him up, at least in terms of actually in terms of both a piece on this team and in terms of a future prospect. And then on top of all that, do I think bogey could maybe come in and, and turn a playoff game against the right opponent with a hot shooting performance, which by the way, he just did a couple nights ago against Philly. Yeah, I do, you know, and, and Burks is capable of doing that too. So for all those reasons, while, while acknowledging the imperfections that you are about to, Lay out. I, I I was in favor and still am in favor of the trade. And has anything changed at all since watching? I don't know. It's been four or five games since they've since they've started actually con- contributing. Has anything in changed in my in my view? Yeah. Has your assessment changed? What if anything? What has changed? Watching them integrate here. Um. I think the thing that has crystallized for me is that if bogey is not in a very strong defensive ecosystem, he it's going to, it's not going to look great. And I think the reason why, and I think this is going to lead into the part of the discussion where it's like, well, they're not going to help you get off the finish line across the finish line. If you don't play him enough to help you get across the finish line, how you doing Josh Hart, 40 some odd minutes. I think, the the issue right now, and this is this is a catch twenty two because it's like, hey, you know who Bogey would look great alongside OG Ananobi. Well, guess who's not going to be back, and who you need Bogey to get you to the point where OG's going to be back. It's like it, so you can't have it both ways. So I think that's where your 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 argument is is a pretty strong one. Well, yeah, I, I mean, look, I. I feel like Andrew wants us to fight this out, but we're probably not going to because it's probably, probably going to find some common ground, which is what we do. We but like, <laughs> but no, I, I from the moment the trade was made, like this is not really like I don't think five games should should determine anything. You know, from the moment the trade was made, I felt like philosophically, what what this team should do because I think what what has changed here is Jalen Brunson has become a dude to build around unquestionably. He's that good. He is, he might be a top 10 offensive player in the league right now. He's close to it. If he's not it. So I like, I think he's there. So build around him, like no question about it. Whether it's another, whether another star comes in is almost, it's a, it's a, it's a parallel course that they're exploring, but now you have a guy. So you need to have that, which they're doing there. You maintain the flexibility to chase guy number two, while also building around guy number one. The philosophy in building around this guy, number one, is size, defense, versatility. Because you're hitting your mic, by the way. <laughs> I'm sorry. Because he is, he is See, I'm being Andrew. everything offensively should be. He's everything offensively, and he has his limitations defensively. And what you saw in January was you surrounded him with exclusively dogs, like absolute monsters. And that includes Precious Achua, who is a physical, who's a, who's a dog. Uh, now he has limitations, which were exploited a little bit yesterday, but he's a dog, an unquestionable dog, defensively rebounding. And what you did here is like, and and we can, uh, Quentin Grimes was 
I want to talk about the basketball side because there's, there's another part of this because all these things are complex. But like Quentin, Gr- there's just in terms of a basketball fit and who he was and potentially could be, like provides you a point of attack defender that you don't have, even with OG Ananobi in some ways, because there are small point guards that I think he guards better than OG Ananobi. And we're talking about the Dames and the Maxis and the Mitchells and the Garlands that are in the East that we might be matching up against. And now you don't have that guy. But the, like just a, a def- proved it in the playoffs last year, a defensive force. Do you mention Halliburton, Halliburton? Although I think OG on Halliburton, I really like that matchup. Okay. Not, as, not as quick, not as fast point A to point B. He's fast. Different kind of player, but yes, including Halliburton. I'm just saying, gave you a different element that, that, that although was lacking a little bit of size, but, but definitely was part of that philosophy <clears throat> in theory. And you traded him. For two guys who I feel like don't quite measure up in that way. And I think Burks is closer than Bogey because Burks has proven on a tips team to do what he does. And yes, he's very limited defensively and probably a little bit more limited now than he was with the Knicks two years ago as he ages, but can generally do okay on like wings and guards. Bogey's a liability. And he talked like he's just, he is a liability defensively. And you've now. If if you want to play him big minutes at whatever point, it's like, well, you have Brunson on the floor, you might have Randall on the floor. You're gonna play bogey with those two guys? What is what does your defense look like even with OG and Hartenstein out there? Is it good enough? And I don't know if the, like I would be more comfortable with Grimes in that lineup than I am with Bogey. And that's just the basketball side of it. I'm not a hundred percent sure the Knicks got better in a playoff matchup. And now to your point. They have to get there. My issue with getting there with these two guys, and I'm sorry, I'm going a little long here. I'll I'll wrap it up in a second. This is great. If you told me anything that we needed at this moment, it was, to me, a backup point guard who could really run an offense for you. And you know what Alec Burks did really well with the Knicks? You know what he was really good with the Knicks is when he played with Derrick Rose and Emmanuel quickly. Yeah, you know what? Alec Burks really struggled with the Knicks <laughs> is when he played point guard. <laughs> yeah, and, and we've seen that, by the way, since the trade. Oh my God, he's he, as he makes some kooky decisions. His shot selection when he has the ball too much is sometimes outrageous. Now I think he needs to get some of the Detroit stink off, where he was allowed to do whatever he wanted. I'm sure Tibbs will smack that out of him in a couple games, but that's not the guy I want running my second unit. He's not a great decision maker. He's really good playing off other good decision makers. So it it both wasn't ideal for me from the standpoint of let's steady the ship here, give Brunson a little bit of rest, have someone else who can control the offense. Bogey's not that guy either. He can get you a bucket. He can. We've seen that. He can get you a bucket and he's certainly a great shooter off the ball. But I really needed someone to just just take the reins every few possessions and handle it. And they, and they haven't added that guy. So I just, and it's hard. I don't know what deals were out there. I don't know what they could have done. I, and, and like, go ahead. I, I just, th- that's, that's where I'm at in terms of like, I'm not sure we accomplished what we needed to accomplish here, both from a short term and a long term perspective. And I'm more concerned about the long term than the short term, but I'm concerned about both. That's the, that's the next logical part of the discussion is the what other deals are out there. And I yeah. think, in looking at not in looking more at trades that were not made, Jordan Clarkson not moved. What was the asking price for him? Um, uh, oh my God, I'm forgetting which Jones. I always forget. I always mix up the, the Joneses, the Jones on Washington. Uh, what was Tyus. the ask? Yeah, Tyus. What was the asking? He was not moved on it for a team that is about to win, you know, 12 games. What was the asking price, you know, for him? And then you get into the contractual part of it, which is why one of the first things you said is it's a tough conversation to blend the on court with the off court. Mm-hmm. You can't have the on court discussion without having the off court discussion, at least in terms of the salary cap stuff, because I think, and I, I've used this phrase several times on the pod over the last few weeks. To me, this is a great example of perfect being the enemy of the good. There was no perfect trade out there where you get the backup point guard that again, is going to, it's going to check the contract box. It's going to check the, we're going to send out an asset that we want to send out and get right. back. Was, an asset there a Brogdon, that, was there a Brogdon yeah. deal out there? Yeah. We don't know. It's hard yeah. to know. We, we don't know. We don't know. Yeah. And, 
Because that's a guy, right, that would have checked both the salary and the backup point guard box. Yes, and that's that's the unknown, and we we don't know. We don't. We just don't know. Maybe that if and if the deal was out there, and that they turn their nose up at it for whatever reason, well, then maybe that's something that we would have to go back and, and look at. What I will, what I, but even with that caveat, I'm not that bothered because my my gut feeling is that I don't think the Knicks front office for one second thinks that any of these guys. Grimes, Bogdanovich, or Burks were ever going to play <laughs> hashtag meaningful. Um, oh boy. So, re- no, really any minutes um, for this team when it is competing for a championship. And I'm not talking about this postseason. I'm talking about next postseason. And I think this was a deal that was made in part to get to give this team a fighting chance because as you as you've implied many times, They've earned it. They've earned like they earned this this team, this iteration of this team sends whatever star they may or not may or may not get this summer. They deserve a chance to make a real go of this thing. And I think they made the the best trade that skirt that that toes the line between now and later to give this team a a, a fighting chance in this post to get to this postseason A and in this postseason B. But I think what for if they're if we're keeping our eye on the prize, which is when is this team really going to be competing for a championship? I think we both agree it's not this postseason. I think it's going to be next postseason. I think that's where you get to. It was maintaining the salary slot. It was getting maintaining the salary slot on a guy who was better than Fournier. No offense. Um, and it was avoiding letting the Grimes thing linger to a point where you were. Maybe going to get even less. And again, I feel bad pointing at that because I don't think they got so little. Like we could sit here and pick nicks at what they got back. I think there was still a nice return for Quentin Grimes, given where he is as a player and given that he's extension eligible this summer. If you let that linger even further, you know, and then again, it, it becomes tough because then are you sitting there? You're sitting there on, let's say the trade, quote unquote, the trade is not there at the end of June. And you do need to carry it into next season and next season's trade deadline. Well, then you're sitting there like, shit, do we have to fucking pick up Evan Fournier's option now? Because like, so I think you, it's impossible to have. So let, yeah. Right. So let, is there a world? What would it have looked like? You had to maintain the salary slot and upgrading from Fournier to Bogdanovich is great in a vacuum. It's great. So what, again, what the Knicks, like the Toronto deal in some ways, or uh, you, you traded a player instead of picks, right? Because to get Bogdanovich for Fournier, you would have had to throw in, I don't know what, probably, I don't know, one of the firsts? If if that would, because it, it seems like to try, I mean, look at the the Fontecchio deal. They, it seems like they want like young players who are going to like help yeah, them so win I now. I don't know if they would have done it. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I Which doesn't answer. mean it's a great deal. Again, some deals, are, the best deals sometimes are the ones I, you right. walk away I, from. And my pushback, my pushback is like I, I was hearing on the airwaves, and it wasn't necessarily just from you. It was from national guys, Zach Lowe, et cetera. Like this was like the most brilliant. I, I just didn't. I, I don't know. Like I, I wasn't like blown away by it. I just the the players are too flawed. They don't totally fit with the with what this team does. And I, I am having trouble seeing either of these guys in a Brunson Randall centric team, assuming that's what it is, at least for this year. And who knows what next year is. But like, I don't see either of those guys being massive value adds just because of the, again, philosophically, what you have to do to build around those two guys and more specifically Brunson, more specifically Brunson. And like, it, it's just, I mean, God, I mean, you saw it last night and I know it's the Celtics, but like, who who can Bogdanovich guard on that team? Is there one guy he can guard on that team? Sam Hauser? Like Horford no, but it, killed if him. It gets if he matched a- up on the wings, he fouled him every time. Like he yeah. could not match up against anybody in the game, and that is problematic. And if it gets to us, I mean, listen, if we wind up in a in a in a matchup with the Celtics and we're and it's a close matchup, like we should all, I think, we'll all be pretty happy with that. I would be happy with that. I mean, I shouldn't speak for anybody else. Um, I would be happy with that. I'd love to see that. I think it would be fun basketball uh, if they're healthy. Again, if they're healthy. Um, and maybe that's not a series where he could play. And maybe it's a series Grimes could have played at. And and you know what? Maybe I don't think there, look, I don't think there's any question Grimes could he could play. 
Yeah, like for sure. He's yeah. proven he can play in the playoffs. He's yes. still a spacer, even if he's not the shooter Bogdanovich. He's not the shooter Bogdanovich is because he doesn't have the variety. He doesn't have the depth. Like he's a damn good corner shooter. Still is. Always has been. He provides the spacing you need, and he can absolutely guard at the point of attack. Now, maybe he's had he'd have some trouble with the wings with Tatum and Brown, who can bully him a little bit. But you can start him on White. You can start him on Holiday. You could feel pretty good about those matchups. He could have played in that series. I, you know, I don't think there's any question he could have played in that series. 12, 14, 15 minutes. A hundred. Yes, and that, and you just nailed it. I think, and this is really what it comes back down to. Bogey, maybe he could play in that series. Maybe he can't. I think the Knicks feel pretty good, and I think this is justifiable. And this is maybe look, we're going to see one of us is going to be right, one of us is going to be wrong. I think there will be moments that Bogdanovich will have a positive impact in the playoffs and and, and help you win playoff games against certain matchups. And on the flip side, you just said it with Grimes. I think the Knicks looked at the situation and looked at him and looked at the larger let larger ecosystem of the team with DiVincenzo emerging in the way he is and with Hart mm-hmm. obviously being the you know in the coaches like Tibbs loves Hart. Like there's no question about that. And then when you throw in the fact that they're that if they do get another guy here, now if they get another guy, it's probably I mean is it going to be Randall going out? Is it going to be one of the centers going out? Like we don't, but we don't even need to talk about that because, like, we just there's your seven. Like you got your seven, and then by the way, you got Deuce there. Who, who did the team give a new contract to? As, as soon as the OG trade was done, it was Deuce Supra. Yeah, they, they got they got their their secondary wing, small wings under contract in Deuce and Divincenzo. There wasn't room for Grimes. And and probably what happens to Grimes is they don't reach an extension if they keep him because he wants a bigger role and he wants to start somewhere. And you have a quickly situation. And uh, he should. And you have a quickly situation again. And larger than that, he wasn't happy. I think that was clear. It's been reported. Um, Hell, it's like on my Twitter account when his like trainer likes every time I say that like Grimes should play more. So like it's very clear that he was unhappy. And and the extent to which I'm just saying like they weren't hiding it. And like the extent to which that played into it too is hard for us to know. Like, uh, and we, so we, uh, hold on, we have a good idea. Yeah, I guess you have a good idea. No, I th- no, I think we both have a pretty good idea that the the, the relationship had soured. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah yes, yeah. Like, so like, I'm, that's all that said. I understand the deal. I understand the deal. I understand why they did it, and I think. I'm having trouble as someone in this season looking beyond this season because I'm in this season. But like, obviously, I think the front office is rightfully not thinking just about this season. And frankly, the chances of this season now being everything you want it to be with this in, with injuries that have taken place are pretty slim. Um, but you have the proof of concept. You have the January proof of concept that you've built something pretty cool. And now it's about figuring it out. So... I understand the deal. I don't love the deal. I, I don't love the two players that we got. I, I I mean, I do love Alec Brooks. God knows I love Alec <laughs> Brooks, but but not not to play point guard with my second unit. Um, and I'm worried about where those guys fit in for the rest of this year, at least. And Bogdanovich maybe next year too. Um, so that's that's where I'm at. He and he may be with the team, but like again, like they're. Like, but again, because they're if the if the deal if the trade is not there before it's time to it's it, for him it's not an option it's like a two million dollar guarantee like there's no world where Bogdanovich is on the roster and they decline his his uh, his or they not guarantee him because the, no, the soup be, must continue yeah the soup is going to continue and he's like like he's a it's a good he's a good asset a nineteen million dollar expiring contract next season like and, and I don't yeah. I, I, look, I'm gonna be coined the the Bogdanovich hater now fine I can take it I'm just saying I totally understand what he does well God he is a great shooter not a good no, one you, a great one you he's made your point shooter. very clear which is like again are you helping me in a in the sort of playoff games that we are now and this is a great position to be in if you're a Nick fan we're talking about like the upper 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 echelon of the playoffs like can you help me in those playoff games and that's what we should be thinking about to some extent so I I don't blame you at all and large yeah and that and just like like what what team are we building around the guy that we found that we're lucky now enough to have like what who are the guys I want around that guy and he doesn't quite fit the mold um, but he'll help us in games he he just won he quote unquote won a game for us against Philadelphia just three days ago. So uh, he's a valuable player. He does some things really well. And uh, I just, I'm lower on the trade than I think a lot of people were. And I think that's okay. 
<laughs> See, we, we, we agreed at the end of the day. <laughs> Sorry, Andrew. Yeah, bad radio. Uh, let's just very quickly, because we went very long on that, which I'm happy because I, I wanted to hash that out because I feel like that's been... It, it's it's a worthy discussion point because there's really not much else to talk about with this team right now because of the injuries. So speaking of the injuries, um, the updates on Randall, uh, as you've kind of referenced already, not ruling out surgery. Um, and then the OG part of it is that he will... It seems like he will be back relatively soon after his reevaluation, which I believe is scheduled to take place this Thursday. I, I think. Do we have to be like the like NHL teams with this? Like, why is it all so mysterious? God, it's very frustrating. We have no freaking clue when these guys are going to be back. No, we don't. Um, but that's the Knicks also. I, but yeah, they're not, it's not just I mean. the Knicks. A lot of teams are like that. And then the iHeart thing you also mentioned as well, where he was frustrated after his ramp up was not. As 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 much of a ramp up as he anticipated initially, I'm I'm more worried about his health. I'm not worried about the fact that he said he was a little frustrated after the Philly yeah, game. Yeah, agreed. The the Randall thing. Can I just say my two cents on that? Which is that like a lot of people made a very big deal out of him getting in front of the microphone and saying like they haven't we haven't completely ruled out surgery. I took that as like, well, of course you haven't ruled out surgery because you got to see how the fucking thing responds when you get on the court and start hitting people. That I that's that. I wasn't whatever my concern level was before that he said that it didn't change until after he said that I'm concerned about how he looks when he gets out there and he starts trying to hit people. Um, but that concern existed before he went up and said what he said. It concern, and it, it's just now. So I, you know, I'm more curious when he's going to try to get back out there. Cause I think like you and like a lot of people I'm anticipating. I mean, honestly, at this point with OG, I kind of signed for him being back before the West Coast trip, which there's there's uh one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight games until that. Um I don't know. I think that's is that maybe I'm being too conservative. Um and then Randall, I I mean, I don't would it shock you if he's back in March? It wouldn't shock me if Randall's back in March. No, it wouldn't shock me. It wouldn't shock me. It's just like I don't know what he's gonna look like. Um it's like a Never compare your my experiences to NBA experiences, but like I, I my senior year in college was ruined because our center separated his shoulder. You told me this, and I just remember it. It, it was he did it once, and then did wanted to avoid surgery because he wanted to finish the season, and just never could get it right. And it was like every time he reached in a funny way for a rebound, anytime he led with that shoulder on a drive, it was just never comfortable. He was never the same. Um, for the rest of that year. So it's like, it, it's just a hard injury. It's just a, and, and the way he plays and he leads with shoulders with his big, brawny, crazy shoulders all the time. And like, look, he has much, 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 much better care and around the clock treatment than our division three center had God knows. Uh, and that's, and he's also a physical freak, which God bless Michael Berg wasn't a physical freak. Uh, so there's, there are differences <laughs> out, Michael, wherever you are. Yeah, there are differences, but um, I don't know. I'm worried about, I'm, I'm just worried about it. I'm not, I'm not, I am not like optimistic that he's going to come back and look like Julius Randall. Can I, can I say the thing you're, you're not supposed to say? Yes. Um, I don't think it would be the worst thing in the world if he came, tried to come back, gave it a go and was like, you know what? Is this is it? It's not right. Let's get the surgery now, Be because back. you know what? Then a, you want to talk about house money and gravy, and it's like I'm not saying like it would be, it would be okay if the Knicks got like swept out of the first round. Like no, they would they would, but I'd actually at that point be like, like okay, like yeah. you, you lost yeah. an all star, like whatever you do now this season, I'm I'm kind of okay with. Like just go out there, show a commensurate effort, and I think it would be, and again, and this is the part you're really not supposed to say. <laughs> like we keep talking about getting the star, right? Well, okay, we're not trading Brunson. Uh, I don't, I don't know who's like dying to swap out the Divincenzo spot in the starting five. Now we, that's maybe a longer conversation we could have during the off season, but like, whatever. He's been pretty damn good. Um, yep. OJ and Nobi ain't going anywhere. No, nope. which then it leaves you with two spots left, and I, there's, I mean, we look, we know if Embiid. If that happens, well, that, then that's an easy solution. Then we know what's going to happen. It's, it's the center that you, you you build your center position around him. But if it's not Embiid, 
And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, well maybe there's a, a big wing that's available or something. It's like, all right, well, who's the guy that's going to go out? Who's making enough salary that when you pair with, but like, and this is not a disparagement of Julius Randle, but to, to the notion of like, let's see what this team at minus uh, minus Randall would look like. And, you know, in some high stakes playoff games without that second guy there to sop up a lot of attention. I like you and like a lot of people think they would struggle because Julius means a fucking lot to this team, but I'd at least be curious to see it. You know, that's it, all. Yeah. I'd be curious if you get it. everyone else back healthy, at least where you're not, this doesn't look like this, right? So you yes. have OG at the starting at the four. Um, and you have Mitch back. So you have 48 minutes of like really, really top notch center production. Yeah. And you have precious as a depth piece and whatever. Like I exactly, it, it would, it would suck and you would lose. I don't think you're a contender at that point or even though, even a quasi contender without Julius, but I think it would be a valuable information gathering exercise. Like, there you what go. does this look like without Julius and super big picture? Like we've all thought about this a million times. Is like, all right, if you get a second star and it, what does Julius look like as a third option? Like, is that even worth it? Like, he it, does he have to be part of the move to make it? So yeah, I mean. It sucks that we're talking this way because this season after January, all you wanted to talk about was where this season could go. And these injuries have definitely put a damper on that. And we're looking at it realistically, I think, as like we don't really know when these guys are getting back and what they're going to look like. And what are realistically, is there a chance we have at the January team full strength heading into the playoffs? I think are pretty low, unfortunately. So I don't know. It's 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 worth it's worth mentioning that if that's the option he has to take, then okay, at least there's there's still value there's still value in that. That's all I wanted to do uh, was was mention it. Um, and worth noting, they could start talking extension this summer with Mr. Randall mm. and Mr. Brunson actually. Um, although I think it's I don't I don't expect anything to happen with Jalen because uh, he is going to get paid. Uh, let's uh, give out some some game balls. Uh, game balls, as everybody knows, given out to a player, coach, or entity that stood out this week and deserves special recognition. Uh, as always, I will read verbatim what the great Andrew Claudio has written here on the old the old KFS pod rundown. <laughs> Is the goat? <laughs> um, Jalen Brunson. Or for, oh, I forgot. We re- actually renamed this the Jalen Brunson game ball because he could just get it every week. Uh, attended his first All Star game in Indianapolis. Recruited like hell during the game. Is that a fact, Andrew? Uh, Josh Hart uh, shot 52.4% from the field and 36.8% from three in 158 minutes. My God, these last four games. Pressure Sachua, 57 points and 51 rebounds, 27 on the offensive glass uh, in the last four games. Uh, Boyan, uh, the aforementioned Boyan, an important six for six from three in the Knicks' only win uh, versus Philly. And then... I don't know why this person is listed here, but whatever. I'm I'm just reading off the page. Jacob Toppin represented New York well in the dunk contest, despite some questionable judges' scores. Again, I'm just reading the words. Uh, this, I believe, is just, this. This is to you, uh, Benji. I'm giving the Jalen Brunson game ball to Jalen Brunson. That's a real stretch. Uh, really, because I want to. I want to mention one thing about what's going on. Um, <laughs> First of all, that Celtics game was so fascinating because the Celtics, I think, in a in a classic Missoula kind of like F you, we're gonna play how we wanna play, which I think he should do, was like, we're not gonna trap you. Like, we're gonna play our drop with Porzingis. And you wanna navigate that, go ahead. And you know what happened? For the first two plus court, he navigated it. I mean, he dominated them. He was as good as any offensive player on the floor. Um, there is no coverage. There is no coverage. Like he's at the point where the best coverage is trapping him and getting him out, which he's not great at navigating all the time, honestly. But like, if you're going to play him in any traditional coverage, covering him without two on the ball, he's, he's got an answer. Um, and the one thing that I think they, there's a silver lining to this insanity of him having the usage that he's had and the, the, the load that he's carrying right now. The Knicks have absolutely expanded the playbook for him to move off the ball and receive it from other places on the floor without bringing it up. 
they're running floppy for him, which I'll quickly explain the actions just so people have a visual as I'm saying it. Like floppy is he he'll you'll watch him get go all the way to the under the basket basically, and he'll have a stagger screen on one side, a single screen on the other, and he can choose which way to go. And he comes around the screen. Now he's catching it on the move, and hopefully with an advantage already. They're running gut Chicago, which means you'll you'll notice he'll go basically to the high post, and he'll get a screen to come back up over the ball. And again, like. The Chicago action means he gets a, a screen before the DHO, before the handoff. So he has, again, an advantage as he gets, as he gathers, instead of just having to create it all on his own. They're running little flare actions for him where he's coming off of a screen. If Josh Hart has the ball, for example, Hartenstein will come set a screen for him to come off to the other wing. He'll catch, and now he's got, again, hopefully a step or two, an advantage as he's making his moves. So like this stuff is so valuable. I think it was it was probably necessary for them to develop some of it anyway. They didn't necessarily have to because Julius could soak up with some usage and possessions and Brunson could play off of that. But now you have these, you've developed these actions to hopefully help him um, create some advantages for him so that he doesn't have to do it all on his own. I think that's very valuable. So game ball to him for all that he's carrying and for the way the Knicks are slowly kind of expanding the playbook for him, building around him schematically. Um, I think all of that is great. And he's proven that he's worth all of it. He's just worth all of it. I mean, there it's been 11 games since they lost OG and Julius Brunson has played in 10 of those games. They are five and five and they sh- really, I, I don't want to say they should be six and four because who know what would have, who knows what would have happened in the overtime in Houston. But like, I think there's a pretty decent argument that they should be six and four. I, I don't mean this to disparage any of the other players, but like, look at the roster, look at the rest of the roster, look at the guys that he is playing with and that he is doing this with. Um, like they're, I mean, it's, there's some nice talent here, right? There's some nice talent, but, what he's able to do, man, I don't, I, I don't know. Um, one of those very nice pieces, and you mentioned it before. I'm going to give my, my game ball to Precious Chua um, because sometimes you get a nice little surprise uh, when you watch sports, and those are like the best parts of. There are two best things about watching sports: when you watch a guy like Jalen Brunson doing what Jalen Brunson is doing, and then when you get something that just is completely out of nowhere. Like we, Brunson is out of nowhere in a way because we didn't. I don't think anybody had any idea it was going to be this, but Achua is out of nowhere in a different sort of way where it's just like, oh, yeah, I remember. You know, he's a he was a nice first round pick. Miami had some hopes, and then Toronto had some hopes, and then like, eh, is he really going to play here? And then the first ten games happen, and we were like, what is what's going on? And now it's just like he's become. And I thought Fred Katz articulated it brilliantly in the article he wrote the other day where he wrote a few times in the piece, like, this is not the Precious Achua that Toronto traded. This is a different guy. This is a different basketball player. He's doing different things. Um, he's expanded his game, and it's just really cool to see. And I, I understand, yes, he does have the limitations, uh, but, and he's still, like, when you think about it, it's like, okay, so, is he too small to play the five? Can't really shoot enough to play the four? Like, what is he moving forward? I, I those are longer term questions. I, I don't know that we have to get into them too much this season. It's just been fun to watch him do what he's doing. Yeah, I'll tell you what he is. He's a depth piece. And I don't depth know. Depth piece is leading the league of minutes over the last dozen games. No, but like that's the thing is like he's <laughs> yeah. he's eating innings, but like he's doing it with 3 3 ERA. Like he's, he's, yeah. I don't know what he is either. And that's, uh, if you talk to Miami fans, you talk to Toronto people who cover, like, they don't know what he is either. Like, no one really knows what he is. He, he, but he's a good ball player and he's an athletic player and he's uh, got a nose for the ball. Um, he, he can guard, you know, I, I think his defense on some games looks great. Other, like last night, I thought I was, I was, I was not surprised by the offensive struggles against Boston, which I knew were coming. I was a little surprised that he got exposed by Jaylen, by Jalen Brown the way he did. Like theoretically, that should be something he can do decently. And Jalen made some great shots. Like, oh, he was first shot to come out and make a step back three on your first shot is very like, come on. Like he made tough shots all night, but I also he got he beat Precious all you know to the rim a few times and just didn't think Precious really made him feel him at all. His defense isn't perfect, but it's very good and he and it's versatile and. He's he can fill you minutes at the four. He can fill you minutes at the five. Like, is he an important part of a super great rotation? I'm not still not positive. Uh, I have my doubts, but 
is he valuable as a 10th, 11th guy that can do what he's doing right now? Super valuable. What he's done has been invaluable. I mean, what, where would they be without him? Forget I, like that's in terms the question. of the record and then like that they've maintained in this stretch, but also like who, if he's not eating, playing 43 minutes, like who's, who, who, who else playing like there it's unbel- and he's doing a good job. He's doing a good job. I think it's fair. You could only point to probably one game where his efforts were the difference between a win and a loss. And it's the Indiana game where the, you know, Brunson obviously stole the headlines, but I don't think they win that game without Precious. But it, the bigger point is what you just made. It's if he's not eating these minutes, well, who the hell is? And then how much more worn down are other guys? And then it, there, there's a there's a, a real trickle down effect that gets, you know, turns into a slippery slope real quick. So, yeah, where would they be without Precious? I don't, I don't want to know. And I'm happy he's here. Um, OK, detention given to a player, coach or an ent- entity that deserves to sit down for a while and think about what they did wrong. I get first pick here. Uh, our candidates, Alec Burks, 11 of 40. Is that good? <sighs> At six of 22 from three the last four games. He's a minus 43 in 79 minutes. That's that's not great. Uh, Boyan showing up again as a candidate here outside of the Philly game two and nine from three and minus 21 in 41 minutes. Uh how do you pronounce this guy's name? Is it Jason? Jack? Jack? I think it's Jason. Jason. Oh, Jason. I think he just, I think he just spells, spells Jason it. like a weirdo because because he sucks. Uh, Jas- Jason Goble. His parents got him off to a bad start. Yeah, it's his, it's their fault. Uh, we should actually commend you for being an NBA referee this long without the gift of sight. Good job by you, Andrew. Uh, the dunk contest judges. 360 between the legs. Dunk's not doing it for you. Uh huh, and uh, Jaime Hawkins Jr. Because uh, this is we should actually rename this the Jaime Hawkins Jr. Detention Facility. Um, yeah, I'm gonna and give for it sucking a, in the duck contest. Also, yeah, he wasn't. I mean, the whole thing, man. I, I just, whatever. Um, I'm gonna give it to Goebel. Uh That was that was embarrassing, and uh, I really, I just, I genuinely hope it does not. Like the Knicks are not like one game out of something, of yeah. Like yeah. importance come mid-April, that would that would be really, really, really unfortunate. Although I guess we haven't heard the results of the protest yet, so I, yeah. <laughs> um, oh man, this hurts me. It hurts me in the heart. I hurts, I left it, hurts it for me you. In the gut hurts me in the brain. My boy. My favorite Hooper's favorite Hooper. <laughs> Alec, my friend. Dude, what are you doing out there? <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, God. We're not in Detroit, man. No, we're not. No, what we're are not. these shots I'm seeing? What, what, what happened? What is this? Like, did someone tell him he should he should like put on a Jordan Poole uh, per- impersonation? That's the comp. Oh my god, that's the comp. What the hell? Yeah. I'm giving him detention, but I know he's going to learn from it because Tibbs is going to slap this Detroit stink <laughs> off of him. I, I, like what in the <laughs> stop shooting so much? Pass the ball. You're going to make one crazy play every every night because that's been true forever since you've been with the Knicks. Like Tibbs. Head explodes once a night because the last night it was the play where he threw it uh, a, a go. Uh, <laughs> oh my a god! Throw, a throw ahead pass like six feet ahead of whoever it was to, and it went all the way down the court out of bounds. <laughs> You're gonna do some goofy things. That's part of who you are. But rein it in, rein it way in, my man. Like chill out. Uh, I, he's gonna get better. He's a good basketball player. He's gonna help them. But I, I need, I need. The Detroit stink to go away immediately off of my boy. The Alec Burks experience is is not one for the faint of heart. That's <laughs> we, we we knew that we knew that. Like you you must be like this tall to ride this ride. It's it's a, it's a stringent height requirement. Uh, okay, predictions. Uh, and yeah, predictions. Okay, uh, Jeremy won last week. Um, he is go, ten. Yeah, t- ten and five. I, he hit it on the head, so I didn't have a chance to to win, regardless of what I did, because he said one and three, and sadly they they went one and three over the, these four games. Um, so he is ten and five. I am five and ten. The four games that Benji you will pick first: um, three home games against the Detroit Pistons, the New Orleans. Uh, I was about to say Hornets, Pelicans, and the 
suddenly pr- pretty hot. Yeah, red hot uh, Golden State Warriors. Oh, man. And then what, what, what promises to be a a um, a fun filled affair? Uh, a trip to Cleveland next Sunday night on this is ES- an unpleasant four game stretch. It's uh, not. Oh, it's, man. it's not what you want. Uh, that's an ESPN game. The Golden State game, by the way is a TNT game. So a couple of national TV games in a row. That's the, that is the correct, that should, that noise should be your prediction for this week. That noise you just made. Oh man. I'm just going to stay consistent with my general pessimism on this podcast and say one and three. Yeah. I mean, I, I, my, I'm obviously taking two and two. My what I'm wondering is if I would have taken two and two anyway, and I do. I really don't want to sit here and be like, "Of course we're going to win the Pistons game," because I've been a Knicks fan for a long time. They almost lost. They almost lost the last Pistons game. They did, you know. And uh, let's say the, the, your Pistons, your Detroit Pistons, were four and four for a stretch of eight games. Not long. What ago. have I? What have I been saying? It seems solid. They're solid. If it weren't for Monty, they'd actually be solid. Um, they'd, be a, they'd be a playoff team, actually. Look, you don't want, look, Fournier revenge game, Grimes revenge game. Who the hell knows? Like, Alec Burks isn't capable of revenge. He's too nice. He's a nice guy, yeah. Um, and what does Boyan have to be revengeful about? Like, he, you know, whatever. Not much. Um, that said, if they take, if, if, Gotta if. Gotta win that one. That's a must. If yeah. they take care of business against Detroit. I'm confident that they, I don't know which game it's going to be. And again, you look on paper, it's like, okay, well, New Orleans back to back. I don't love that. Warriors playing as well as anyone right now. And then you go into the, the lines then. And yes, I know what happened in last year's playoffs, but like, don't have Mitchell Robinson. Don't have Julius Randle to say nothing of no OG it's, and OB. So it's like, no, it's not even, no, it's not the same game. It's no, not the same game. It's not the same game, but this team often finds a way. And I think we're, and that's why I put Goble in detention because I think we're not for Goble. I think they would have gone two and two in these last four games. And I think they will find a way to go two and two in these next four. Love that. We hope. I'm in. There we go. Um, and that is it for us. Got a little over an hour, not too bad. Uh, with enough tomfoolery that there's probably about 18 minutes of actual basketball <laughs> content in this episode. So I hope everybody enjoyed those 18 minutes. Um, some announcements. <laughs> what? We have um, watch alongs and uh, pregame pods all week. I think. Am I on the am I on the watch along, Andrew, on Monday against Detroit? Indeed, you are. Who, and you who know who else with? is? Who? You know who else is? Mr. Benji Reynolds. Oh, my God. What what could possibly what could possibly go wrong? Uh, Set you guys up perfectly to be on for bogey against his old team. Also, our favorite, t- our favorite secondary team. So, yeah. Yeah. I would never miss the Detroit game. No. I did the post game after the first Detroit game. That's right. You did the post game after that game as well. Oh my God, um, those are it's you two and XJ tomorrow night. You can't so. keep me away from Detroit. No. Oh, um, man. We got XJ on, baby. This will be fun. Go. This will be a good Let's time. Let's do it. Uh, and, uh, okay. So, and, and uh, pregame pods, uh, excited for those as always. And uh, what else? Snapbacks. Uh, go to the KFS merch store. There's a link in the description of this mm. episode on either YouTube or. Uh, in podcast form, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, Andrew's wearing one of the hats right now. I still need to order mine. It's a bad job by me. He, look, he's showing all the different versions of the hats. My goodness gracious, this madman. And uh, oh. my, is he wearing all the hats at once? He's wearing four hats. Thank you, Andrew. And then last but not Which least, is what he does at KFS as well. I was going to say, it's a, it's a metaphor for my, my real job. It's a metaphor. <laughs> look, Shout look. out Ben Stiller, our boy. Uh. <laughs> Yes. A little on the nose. Ben Stiller, if you're listening to this, shout out to you for being awesome. Um, and uh, last but not least, this is for our Ewing and Monroe tier uh, patrons. Uh, we got a town hall this Wednesday um, at 8.30 p.m. It's going to be a uh, so it's going to be a busy week. Lots of lots of games, lots of stuff. Um, hopefully some wins. Benji, any last thoughts? Love you, Jeremy. Peace out, everybody. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. Andrew, anything from you? Love you, Jeremy. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having Benji. <laughs> and I will conclude by also saying love you, Jeremy, and love to everybody listening. Um, but 
love more than anybody out there uh, to someone who's probably not going to listen to this because she has just way too much shit to do these days. But uh, happy belated 40th birthday to my wife, my better half, my best friend, uh, the person uh, without whom I, my God, would I be up uh, fucking Shit's Creek without a paddle. Uh, so Dolores, happy 40th birthday. Uh, thank you for continuing to put up <laughs> with me. The kids will still be on the plane, if not for Mrs. Macri. Man, I, I don't even like, yeah. Yes. I would be, be wandering a, in the wilderness. be adopted by Delta. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love you, baby. Uh, and I love you guys. And I love everybody listening. So uh, thanks uh, for checking it out. If you dig the show, to give a five-star rating, uh, leave a review, all that stuff. And we will be back with more fun and games very soon. Peace out. I was thinking on the drive over here that I should have made, instead of Jacob Dolores, the fifth game ball candidate. It's a great call. But then you have to give it to Dolores. And it takes the fun out of... Who the game Dude, ball? If you is, give a game you know, ball to Precious Achua over Dolores. I it would have it, made this final birthday shout out a bit hollow. 